Pray with me, will you? Father in heaven, thank you for this evening. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you've given us the opportunity to come together this evening and open your word that you've preserved through the ages, Lord, that points to a future that we can embrace and be encouraged even now that we anticipate it, Lord. Thank you so much. In Christ's name, amen. All right, go ahead and open your Bibles to Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40. I know that you've been blessed by Smed's exposition of the book of Daniel. It's been uh, a wonderful, wonderful exposition of the book of Daniel. Daniel is just so encouraging. Um, We uh, uh, are encouraged by Daniel's prophecy about the future. And as we look at the book of Isaiah, we'll also be looking about looking at the future and, and looking at his prophecy. I had every intention to unpack Isaiah 40, verses 12 through 26 tonight. Isaiah 40, 12 through 26 is, is God's bio. It is the most potent, perhaps, bio of who God is. And it's been a blessing to be in that passage lately, but you cannot separate who God is from his, from the intentions that he has. And so we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 40 in its entirety tonight. So read with me, will you? Comfort, O comfort, my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed that she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become a plain, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, call out. Then he he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is grass, and its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up and do not fear, says, say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arms, in his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? And marked off the heavens by the span, and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure, and weighed the mountains in a balance, and at the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult? Who gave him understanding, and who taught him the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and informed him of the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beast enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? As for the idol, a craftsman casts it, a goldsmith plates it with gold, and a silversmith fashions chains of silver. 
He who is too impoverished for such an offering selects a tree that does not rot. He seeks out for himself a skillful craftsman to prepare an idol that will not totter. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He it is who reduces rulers to nothing, who makes the judges of the earth meaningless. Scarcely have they been planted, scarcely have they been sown, scarcely have their stock taken root in the earth, but he merely blows on them and they wither, and the storm carries them away like stubble. To whom then will you liken me, that I would be his equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these stars, the one who leads forth their host by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord and the justice due me escapes the notice of my God? Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. What an incredible passage. God's bio. I'd like to illustrate something for you. I'd like to frame something up as a guide for understanding the magnitude of our God and the plans that he intends to carry out. But there is no such illustration available because the passage before us crushes anything that can compare to the greatness of our God. Isaiah 40 is in your Bibles to make certain that your expectations align with his purposes. I've entitled the sermon tonight, Waiting on the Incomparable God of the Bible. I've given it that title because that's our part, to wait faithfully until God comes to establish his kingdom on the earth. But waiting is hard. And so in Isaiah 40, the prophet gives us three comforting expectations that produce endurance while you wait on your king. Three comforting expectations that produce endurance while you wait on your king. The first expectation is that when Christ does come and establish his kingdom, the return of Christ, when he returns, it will be unmistakable. It will be unmistakable. Isaiah 40 is broken up into three sections, 1 through 11, 12 through 26, and and 27 through 31. The first section, 1 through 11, is an eschatological proclamation. That is, Isaiah looks forward to the end of your wait, and he says, the time has come. The time has come finally come. The Lord himself is coming to Zion. The promised one, the Messiah, the one who has been anticipated by the prophets in the Old Testament, the one who will crush the head of the serpent, the one who will represent the many, heal the apostasy of Israel, 
and be the ruler over all the earth as the Davidic king in Jerusalem. His arrival is is imminent. And so Isaiah begins this chapter with an exhortation to comfort. Comfort my people, he says. Now, the first few verses of uh, Isaiah 40 have a nuance that is uh, specific to Israel and, and as an ethnic people, a, a nation, but you've been grafted into the promises that they have received. And so you can also embrace these uh, promises. The basis for comfort will follow in the following verses, but I want you to understand something. The comfort that the Bible describes is not the comfort that we worship as a culture. And so you need to make a distinction between the words comfort in Isaiah 40 and comfort that our culture worships. Culture, uh, comfort, the way the Bible explains it, is, the, is being convinced of future promises of God. Our society worships comfort, comfort by, by finding it apart from God. But for the Christian, comfort means being rightly related to God and taking him at his word, being fully convinced of a future expectation that transcends your current circumstance. That is what comfort is. And so in verse 2, you can see the reasons why comfort is something that you can embrace. Look at this. It says, uh, introduced... All in the same way, you see three reasons. That her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And so as Isaiah looks forward to the future and looks at a a coming inauguration day of the king, he says to, to comfort because these three the, the, rather, these, these, I'm sorry, these three reasons for comfort can be embraced by all of us. The, everyone who enters into the kingdom will have their iniquity removed. And you might ask the question, what, what is this receiving double for from the Lord's hand for all her sins? This is specific to Israel and ethnic Israel when the Lord returns. You've been studying Daniel, and you know that the second coming of Christ will interrupt the worst tribulation that the world has ever known. The world at that time will have aligned itself against God and against his people. In those days, Israel will be enduring hostility from the world while God's wrath is being poured out. And when Christ returns, he will end that struggle. Listen to the words of Matthew in Matthew 24. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days have been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short, Jesus says. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from, the, from one end of the earth to the other. And when Jesus returns, he will establish the kingdom that the Old Testament and the New Testament look forward to, that every believer has anticipated. And for Israel, this means a regathering from around the globe. Ever since the dispersion of ethnic Israel that began in, when the northern kingdom was taken captive by Assyria 2,700 years ago and then continued after Titus Vespasian leveled Jerusalem in 70 AD. Since then, 
God's promises to Israel for a land as an everlasting possession with peace on all sides and a kingdom that will last forever has remained outstanding. Hosea looks to to that day and he says this, For the sons of Israel will remain for many days, that's now, without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, and without ephod or household idols. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. Her iniquity removed, her warfare over, finally able to rest in a double portion of God's grace. Israel will be able to rest in the kingdom. What do we say about this double portion? Uh, Some commentators take it as uh, uh, a consequence for sin, but it actually does not fit the sequence of blessing found in that passage. Isaiah 61 says this, Instead of of your shame, you will have a double portion. And instead of your humiliation, they will shout for joy over their portion. Therefore, they will possess a double portion in their land, and everlasting joy will be theirs. Now that's an expectation worth looking forward to. That's an expectation worth preparing for. John the Baptist had the privilege of rolling out the red carpet for Jesus at his first coming. Look at verse 3, you'll recognize it. A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. And let the rough ground become plain and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Now, I had plans to bring you back to Luke 4.21 tonight to demonstrate how the prophets often looked at one event that was actually divided into two. You've heard that twice in the last two weeks, but you can remember when Jesus uh, sat down in the synagogue in Nazareth and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, but because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the, fo- to the poor. He goes on to say, to proclaim the favorable day of the Lord, and then declares that today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Well, he stops mid-sentence, if you can remember, uh, from uh, John's sermon a couple weeks ago in Smeds from last week. He stopped mid-sentence because what followed wouldn't come to pass until his second coming. And we see the same thing in this passage. John the Baptist forerunning would be like a flash of light on the horizon before the sunrise of God's kingdom. When Christ returns to establish his kingdom, it will be unmistakable because the glory of the Lord will be revealed not only to the prophets, not in a private vision or a private transfiguration like Peter saw, but all flesh will see it together. When that moment comes, the Bible describes it like this, Matthew 24, 27. For just as lightning comes from the east and flashes even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Matthew 26, 64, and Jesus said to him, these are his accusers, you have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Revelation 1, 7 says, behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. What Isaiah proclaims in one expectation will play itself out in two parts. One part has already been played out. Verses 6 through 8 are God's seal of certainty concerning this expectation. Just as sure as Jesus came the first time, he will come a second time. In verses 6 through 8, 
are like the seal of certainty concerning this expectation. Read with me. A voice calls out, a voice says, call out. Then he answered, what shall I call out? All flesh is like grass. And all its loveliness like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. What's, what's in contrast here? The, the loveliness of man is fickle. The word for loveliness here is the word that is usually ascribed to God, to his loving kindness, his willingness to endure offense and remain unmoved in his commitment to the ones that he loves. Perhaps this is the most important characteristic to sin, from sinful man's perspective. And because man is made in the image of God, we should be made of the same stuff. We ought to reflect who God is in all that we do, in what we say, in our purposes, in our work. Everything we put our hand to should say something about the character of God. But that's not the case. The image of God has been tainted in man, and our commitment is more like the flower petal that sprouts up on the side of the highway, here today and gone tomorrow. In contrast, God's word, his intentions stand forever. This would have been important to Isaiah's readers because nothing about the geopolitics of his day would have given them the impression that God's kingdom would be established anytime soon. Does that sound familiar? Would anything in your geopolitic, uh, in, in the observation of the geopolitics today in the headlines give you the indication that God's kingdom will be established tomorrow? We need God's word. We need to hear from God that he will certainly bring that to pass. but you'd have to take God at his word. Geopolitics would give you the impression that things are unraveling because they are. Things are a mess. But when God sets, uh, sets his intentions in motion, they cannot be stopped. And all of human history is headed in one direction. The God of the universe is coming in the flesh to reign as king over the whole earth. That's where history is headed. And understand that when he arrives, it changes everything. This is a good kingdom ruled by the good shepherd. Look with me at verses 9 through 11. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news, Jerusalem, bearer of good news, do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with might, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock in the in his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead them, lead the nursing ewes. Now, for God's enemies, this is bad news. We, we've heard that from Daniel over the past several weeks. But from Isaiah's perspective, this is Good news, because he's representing the perspective of the ones who will enter the kingdom. The red carpet that John rolled out might be 2,000 years long by now, but make no mistake, it is God who is walking down it, God in the flesh. It says, his arm ruling for him. His arm is, rep is metaphorical language, representing God's visible work in 
this case personified here in the person of Jesus Christ. Isaiah uses the same metaphor of Christ in Isaiah 53.1, when he came as a suffering servant. But make no mistake, on his, upon his second arrival, he will come with all power and authority, and he will bring reward and consequence with him. This should remind you of how your Bible ends. Jesus says this, Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to re- render every man according to what he has done. The good news for God's people is that he will shepherd them by tending to every physical and spiritual need. God living in proximity to his people again, not far off. Christian, the kingdom that you look forward to will be, like, will be unlike anything you have ever seen or known. And when it is established, it will be unmistakable. Here's a summary of what's to come in God's kingdom. All of these expectations are from your Old Testament, and there are too many citations to list. I'm going to give you some categories. World peace. World peace. No more war. No more conflict. Geopolitical stability. Defense spending at zero. No more fear of tyrants or terrorism. Isaiah 2, 4 says, They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. What would you put your hand to if you knew that stability would be your guarantee? Joy and holiness will define the age. Zechariah 8.3 says, Jerusalem will be called the city of truth. Perfect justice will be um, administered by uh, kingdom citizens and embraced by them. Listen to Isaiah 9.7. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from one, uh, from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Isaiah 11 9 says, The earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Instruction will come from God himself. The education system will be perfect. One option. The removal of the curse. Removal of sickness. Removal of infirmity. Listen to the words of Isaiah in chapter 29. On that day, the deaf will hear words of a book. And out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. The afflicted also will increase their gladness in the Lord, and the needy of mankind will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. No more oppression of any kind, longevity of life, abundant productivity of the earth. The earth itself will respond to the establishment of God's kingdom, Hosea says in chapter 2. Man's labor will be productive. There will be no idleness. Full employment, as it were. Every skill put to good use. Economic prosperity. No more third world environment. Language barriers removed. And unified worship. These are big promises. Who could possibly deliver on such a promise? When, when someone makes a promise, that promise is only as good as the one who makes it. The better question rebukes any doubt concerning his kingdom promises when you consider the source. Look with me at verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand 
and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales. The certainty of God's promise for a kingdom on the earth is predicated on who God is. And the God of the Bible is incomparable. He is indescribable. He has no peers. He has no counselor. He has no rival. His plans are unchangeable, no matter how unlikely things may appear. God's character guarantees his purposes. God's character guarantees his purposes. I've grounded that in four categories in the following section. Verses 12 through 26 describe who this God is. First of all, he is a God who is impossible to quantify. He is impossible to quantify. He's unrivaled in every way. His power is extraordinary and his authority absolute. His superior handiwork is evident to all. The series of questions that begin this section are meant to leave you speechless amidst amidst any doubt that he will bring his promises to pass. And Remember, when God asks a question, when a question in the Bible is on the lips of the Lord, that is not for his benefit, that's for yours. See, God has no curiosity. God has nothing to look further into. There's no discovery process for him to undertake. He is simply a God that is impossible to quantify. In your Bibles, if you look at verse 12 in that second line, if you're reading the NAS, the uppercase H should be a lowercase H. H. The, the question here is, is there any hand out there that can do what God, God's hand can do? When, when he spoke the heavens and the earth into existence, he wasn't merely speaking an idea into reality, but this was a calculated work on his part. He is intimately familiar and aware of every condition that humans have discovered along the way. Why? Because he created every condition. The oceans and their currents that are critical to their purpose, the dry land and its purpose, its usefulness. God created those things. He brought judgment on the earth and the flood. And when he did that, he knew exactly how to change the topography and then restore the earth by changing it again. The placement of every heavenly body is set in orbit perfectly in order to synchronize all the axes of the planets to keep everything in place. These things did not happen by accident. They were not an ethereal command. He had a calculated work when he spoke things into existence. Look at verse 13. Who has directed the Spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has informed him? You could translate this passage, who has determined the Spirit of the Lord, or what man has made his advice known to him? This is appraisal language. No created being has ever turned around to give feedback to his creator. He is the author of wisdom and justice, verse 14. With whom did he consult, and who gave him understanding, and who taught him the path of justice, and taught him knowledge, and informed him of every of the way of understanding? He understands all things. He is the author of justice and its course. How do we get from here to perfect justice? God knows. And no one had to teach him. He's never had an apprenticeship. He's never been a journeyman. God is the creator of the universe. The way of understanding in verse 14 has to do with skill and aptitude. 
He's not far off giving conceptual orders. God's work is a calculated one. The seasons and tides and planetary orbits all work together according to his design. Now you look back at his plans, and it becomes audacious to doubt that he could not bring his purposes to pass. He's impossible to quantify, and he is unrivaled in every way. Beginning with the nations, verse 15. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. Even Lebanon is not enough to burn, nor its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as less than nothing and meaningless. The nations pose no threat to our God. The coastlands, the uh, islands rather, in in my text, in the NAS, could be translated coastlands. These are the far-off regions from city centers in Jerusalem and in Judah, perhaps a place that you would head if you knew that your judge was approaching. But no matter, there's no geographical boundary that that is out of God's reach. No amount of resource the nations have to offer could appease him either. Those resources belong to him anyway. Ultimately, the nations are nothing beforehand. And understand what's being said in verse 17. This is appraisal language again, yet this time this is God doing the appraising. And understand that when the Hebrew language expresses the idea of being before the Lord, typically it's expressed by saying before his, uh, uh, to his eyes, to his face. But that's not the case in this verse. There is a spatial correspondence that's being expressed here. The word here is a word that's commonly used that conveys the idea of standing opposite, the, the way that you and I are opposite one another now. When the Israelites were in the wilderness, they camped opposite the mountain. That is, they camped in front of the mountain. When Christ returns and he gathers the nations together where they will be judged, there will be no contest. No contest to his authority because their collective strength will be a zero before him. Listen to Micah's prophecy concerning that moment. The nations will see and be ashamed, ashamed of all their might. They will put their hand on their mouth. Their ears will be deaf. They will lick the dust like a serpent, like reptiles of the earth. They will come trembling out of their fortresses. To the Lord our God, they will come in dread. And they will be afraid before you. He is unrivaled on a national level and at an individual level. Look at verses 18 18 through 20. Well, the end of verse 18. What likeness will you compare to him? That is, what likeness can you prepare to him? What likeness could you prepare to God? How could you possibly represent him? His likeness cannot be crafted by the ones who were crafted by him. He can only be represented in the God-man, Jesus Christ, who is the exact representation of his nature. We heard about that from Omri this morning. No wonder there was a prohibition on crafting objects in the form of God. It cannot be done. God cannot be domesticated, to borrow John's terminology. Yet it's man's instinct to put God in a box and bring him out when it suits him. When man invents a God of his own image, that deity never exceeds the scope of man's ability to understand it. But the God of the Bible is not limited by your ability to understand him. We cannot even understand each other. 
How could we possibly get our minds around all of who God is? Yet he has revealed himself clearly and sufficiently from the beginning. Look at verse 21. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? Four questions. Two are open-ended and two leave you without excuse. God has never been silent. He's never left man without guidance. Even fallen man's condition, in fallen man's condition, he has left us with self-disclosure. 21 through 25 demonstrate another reason his purposes are certain to come to pass. His power is extraordinary and his authority absolute. Verse 22 takes you outside your own perspective to help you understand how extraordinary his power and authority really is. You might depend on God's abilities the way you depend on another man, but God is not like you. He is not like another man. He is not limited. He says this, It is he, God, who, li- who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. It's he who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. Grasshoppers live for about one year. They're unaware of the generation that came before them. They're in no control over the generation that comes after them, only concerned with what to consume in front of them. You are more like a grasshopper than you are like God. That is, you couldn't begin to understand how powerful God is and how he works every detail of his skill and aptitude for his purposes. The end of verse 22 is fascinating, really. It explains, it illustrates what happened on the second day of creation. He it is who, I'm sorry, he stretches out the heavens like a curtain. It's amazing to think that God created the entire universe by stretching it out all at once. I asked Ken Ham once, I was with him one evening and I, at a dinner, and I said, what about distant starlight? Well, if, things, if, if stars are millions of light years away and it takes millions of years to get the light here, and we have a young earth, how, how do you reconcile those things? And he said something about quantum physics and it's time for dinner. I don't got to eat. <laughs> but he did recommend a book to me. And Dr. Russell Humphreys, a Christian uh, astronomer, uh, has a book called Starlight and Time. And it explains that in order to reconcile those things, time, light, gravity, it must have been stretched out all at once. God's word answers science's questions. The person Christ upholds all things by his power. Listen to Colossians 1, 15 through 17. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the supreme authority, the only authority. Every other authority loses their significance by comparison. That's what verses 23 through 24 tell us. It's him who reduces rulers to nothing and makes them meaningless. Daniel 2 says that it is he who changes the time and the epics and he removes the kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. God is in the business of raising up rulers and putting them down. Sometimes this happens quickly. For instance, after World War II, if you look at a geopolitical map, you see Great Britain over most of it, and then afterwards... Back to the island. There's changes of power that happen throughout the ages, and God is in control of all of those things. Most of the time, through long periods of time, 
nations change through marriages, treaties. India, UK, the France, Syria, Jordan, these countries might seem like they have a long heritage on the earth. How could they ever go away? But look at verse 24. Scarcely have they been planted. Scarcely have they been sown. Has their stock taken root in the earth? But he merely blows on them, and they wither, and the storm carries them away like stubble. It's remarkable language. Hosea 14 Five, you don't have to turn there, but it is remarkable when you look at the language that, that he uses, the idea that nations are not sown, nations are not planted, this agrarian language. Here's what he says about his nation, Israel. He says, I will be like the dew to Israel. He will, be, he will blossom like the lily, and he will take root like the cedars of Lebanon. That's in contrast to nations who are not grounded. The language in Hosea 14 paints a a vivid picture of roots that are thrust into the ground all at once. That's what it will be like when God establishes his kingdom. It will be certain, and it will take place at his arrival all at once. His superior handiwork is evidence to all. Direct your attention to him, he says in verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created the stars. I'm not sure if you look at stars often, but the Hubble Space Telescope has been a wonderful gift to humanity over the last 30 years. It's recently been replaced. I'm not sure if you realize that or not. The newest space telescope is called the James Webb Telescope, and it went up in December where the Hubble Space Telescope floats about 250 miles off the surface of the Earth, the James Webb Telescope is stationed on the dark side of the moon. We we expect to get images back from this telescope uh, this summer, June, July. And mark my words, when we receive images from that telescope, the scientists will say, the universe is way bigger than we thought. There's even more stars than we thought. There's more galaxies than we thought. The universe is way bigger. How how big is the galaxy right now? Well, right now, they say that there are 200 billion trillion stars. How do you come up with that number? I don't know. But maybe they'll be quintuple that when we get our images back in July, June, July. The heavens exclusively belong to God. He says, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. He places every light in heaven exactly where it pleases him, all 200 billion trillion or more. The third and last expectation that produces endurance endurance from Isaiah 40 is that his strength will not fail you. His strength will not fail you. Look at verses 27 through 29. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel? You can, just, you can just plug your name in there and ask the question, why have you said my way is hidden from the Lord? The, the question here is, why have you lost heart in your current circumstance? In fact, even more so, why have you taken up a victim mentality? This is a problem in our day. The victim culture is not something we should embrace. Victim culture is inherently connected to entitlement, far from how the Bible describes believers. In 1 Peter 3, you don't have to turn there, but I'll read it for you. 1 Peter 3, this is a contrast from the the environment that we live in that seeks out the virtue of victimhood and the contrast of Peter's environment where there were real victims. And that's not to disparage someone who has been an actual victim of crime or circumstance, but you know that the victim culture has turned victimhood into uh, uh, into something that, to a virtue, that's the word I was looking for. In, In Peter's day, 
They were being persecuted because they were Christians. And yet, here is how Peter instructs them. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for doing good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But here's the command. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. Look, if you don't sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, and Christ is competing with other idols in your heart, you don't have to have a ready answer because no one will ask you where your hope lies. You will look just like the world. The command to sanctify Christ as Lord in your heart is how we wait well for the Lord to return. It's how we wait well for the Lord to return. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, Yahweh, the creator of the ends of the earth, he does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. You see, God is the source of our endurance. And because God is the source of our endurance, his strength will not fail us. He looks at the strongest among us and says, even youths grow weary. I looked at the average age of an Olympian, 22 years old. So if you're past 22, it's all downhill, downhill from there. But even they grow weary, and they grow tired. And it's true that God supplies strength for us in the moment, in the present age. But I believe that verse 31 is a promise for those who wait on the Lord now. Their outcome will be new strength. And they will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. When Christ arrives to establish his kingdom. He will make all things new, and it's worth waiting for. Pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement from Isaiah 40. We love you in Christ's name. Amen.